Yes, hello uh, everybody. My name is Evans, Evans Ogoti, a, re a resident in obstetrics and gynecology from Moy University and uh, Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital Eldoret. Welcome to this talk. We want to look at maternal hemorrhage. So, number one, what do you want to see we achieve at the end of this presentation? So we want to recognize obstetric hemorrhage. So then we're going to, we're going to talk about some of the skills that you need to respond to a woman who is bleeding and uh, in your own practice or in your free time as you go through this, you get to see how you can achieve competence in those skills needed to manage these patients. So we find that uh, obstetric hemorrhage is uh, the most common cause of maternal deaths uh, worldwide, accounting for about 30% of maternal deaths. And uh, what is saddening in all this is that these deaths that are arising from hemorrhage are things that we can avoid. reason why managing hemorrhage is a challenge, especially in the cases of major hemorrhage, is we always tend to underestimate blood loss. And, uh, the reason for doing this probably is because uh, some of us do not know how to estimate blood loss or uh, most of us are careful. We are careful enough to just give a figure that cannot be considered major hemorrhage when estimating uh, blood loss. Eh? I, I, I'm sure we've come, we've come across scenarios where, say in theatre, the OR is actually flooding with blood, eh? but if you look at estimated blood loss, what is indicated there? Some things that you know, 600, 800 mils, or you've used so many pads or so many packs uh, in labourhood, but you estimate a blood loss of 150 to 100 mils. Reason being, you want to be careful enough not to estimate a volume that you consider uh, PPH. So, what are some of the causes of uh, hemorrhage? So this can be looked at uh, bleeding during pregnancy or during labor. And uh, during pregnancy, some of the causes can include incomplete abortions. Maybe she has an ectopic pregnancy, a molar pregnancy. Uh, an abrupt or a preview of the placenta can also be a cause during pregnancy. And the uh, cervical lesions. Most of us tend to forget the fact that even though this lady is pregnant, she's still prone or she's still at risk of uh, having various gynecological issues. Let's take an example of a lady that's pregnant and has, uh, say, cancer of the cervix. Of course, she'll still, she'll still bleed. What about labor? Again, uh, abnormalities, issues with the placenta, abruptio previa, uh, maybe a ruptured uterus, uh, which, though it's rare antenatally, it may still, uh, it may still occur. Let's always remember coagulation disorders can also be a, a problem either during pregnancy or during labor. So, why, how comes most of us fail to recognize hemorrhage? Number one, we fail to under, we, we usually tend to underestimate blood loss reasons, some of the reasons I had alluded to earlier. And this is, this, this actually be, is one of the reasons why we are slowly Though we still accept the traditional definition of PPH in terms of volume of blood lost, 500 or 1,000 in case of vaginal or cesarean deliveries, but again, any volume that a patient loses that makes her hemodynamically unstable, that qualifies as PPH. So we, are, we want to appreciate more clinical presentation of the patient versus the actual volume lost when deciding whether a patient has had a severe hemorrhage or not. Now, during, during pregnancy, the ladies, or the, the, the ladies' physiology is, changes in such a way that she's able to adapt to a uh, volume of blood losses, eh? meaning if she starts showing signs of hypovolemia, then appreciate the fact that the blood loss is, 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 is quite an amount. And uh, she may end up losing up about 30 to 35 percent which if you estimate that would be about two liters of blood before features or signs of hypovolemia start showing so one of the ways that she compensates or that the mother compensates for blood loss 
is by reducing supply to the fetal placental unit. So the baby becomes compromised. And again, and unvital organs like the skin also are deprived, uh, deprived of blood. Okay, so what are some of the signs of hemorrhage? So, Pala, your patient is tachycardic, she is tachypnic, because the heart is beating faster so that uh, the little that is left can be supplied in the body. She is breathing very fast because, of course, uh, the demand for oxygen has gone quite high at this point. Confusion and fear. So this is the kind of patient that uh, you've, you've fixed your, your cannulas, IV cannulas, but now she's so confused, she's busy chucking them off. Eh? The patient is plucking off cannula, catheter after, uh, cannula after cannula. So you, you are there, all very mad and uh, angry with the patient. You know, you, you keep fixing a line, she keeps plucking it off. So before we, we brand these patients as difficult patients, which is what most of us rush to do, let's appreciate the fact that this may actually be confusion because of uh, the bleeding. Again, uh, hypotension, but this, this is a late sign. By the time your BP starts, to, starts uh, dropping, most times you are had, your, your, your pulse will have gone high, your respiratory will have also gone high. The kidneys are affected, then uh, you start getting that your urine output is reduced. And uh, let's appreciate that you may not always see bleeding. It may not always be obvious. At times, it will be hidden. So, like I had said earlier, when you start seeing signs of uh, hypovolemia or of bleeding in this patient, appreciate the fact that this bleeding has been quite massive because remember what I said about uh, this this patient being able to compensate for large volumes lost. So when you see signs, suspect we've lost quite an amount, move in very quickly and act or you're going to lose that patient. So how do we manage hemorrhage? Number one, what's very important is that you need to have a protocol. You know, you can have one that is tailored to, to, to your center or you can use a national protocol or an, an international protocol or even if even if you have one that is tailored i'm sure you'll borrow heavily from a national or an international uh, approved uh, protocol next thing you need to do call for help uh, you know someone once said and uh, I, I want to agree with them is that there is there is no hero in medicine we we are not going to give you a trophy because you struggled with that patient alone and uh, there was help around but you chose to do it alone no call for help you always need to be helped now, but uh, the next thing you want to do is your abc's please remember resuscitating these patients takes priority so your airway breathing and circulation that is your primary survey needs to be a bit, to have been sorted out then you can now move to your secondary survey where essentially you want to find out what was the problem why was this patient bleeding why was this patient in this state Good. So patients who with the hypovolemia or patients with hemorrhage, patients who bleed, they tend to have a C problem. So their issue will be circulation. So at circulation, after you've done your assessment, next thing you want to do is fix uh, IV cannulas. The reason you are doing this, remember, is you want to replace volume at the same time stop the bleeding. That is your main or your key objective under C. So you fix your IV cannulas, like I've said, but again, we are, we are assuming that you are now meeting this patient for the first time because if it's a patient that had been in labor with you in your unit, it's, it is advised that any lady that is in labor must have an IV line in situ. So you probably probably be fixing your second line at this point. Take samples for investigations, grouping cross match, your coagulation analysis. So you want to know how is this patient, uh, how are the clotting factors like? Remember, I, you, you realize that I've not talked about uh, hemoglobin at this point because of issues of hemoconcentration, the HP may not be so reliable at this juncture. Good. You fix, you, you fix your line, you take your samples, now put up your IV fluids, your normal saline, your ringers lactate, run it very, very fast. And if you, are, if you have blood, preferably uh, whole blood, at this point, it will be advisable to give that to the patient. Good. So, look out for any potential coagulation disorders. Remember, I talked about uh, clotting factors assessment. 
you may also want to do your bedside clotting tests can also help uh, tell you how are we in terms of uh, clotting in this patient give the patient to an examic acid this is an international or an, it's also a national uh, protocol where any patient diagnosed of PPH regardless of the cause is supposed to receive IV tranexamic acid, one gram, it's a slow injection, and then immediately you are done with that, assess your patient. If 30 minutes later she's still bleeding, there's room to give a repeat dose. Now this needs to happen within three hours uh, of birth. Something I forgot to insist on, remember when I talked about IV access, please uh, get at least two large bore cannulas, preferably gauge 16 the gray, or uh, if you have if you can get the gauge 14 even better most of us will have the gauge 18 the green cannulas it's still uh, okay to use those so pph what are the causes of pph so when you talk about postpartum hemorrhage essentially uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage that is the causes will be the 40s which i'm sure we are all uh, conversant with either atony which accounts for quite a number 70 percent of the cases Issues of retained tissue, any tears, including ruptured uteruses, and uh, issues with the coagulation, those are thrombin disorders. What is important for you to appreciate is that these T's do not always occur in isolation or follow a specific uh, sequence or pattern. So you can get a combination. So the fact that your patient is has atony doesn't mean that uh, they cannot have tears also at the same time. So just make sure you look out for all the 40s. Good, so let's look at atony, the most common cause of primary PPH. How do you manage it? Like I had said earlier, start with your resuscitation of the patient. So your primary survey, your ABC are still important. Calling for help is very, very key. Next thing you want to do, Massage that uterus so that you are able to rub up or stimulate a contraction and while you're doing that expel expel the clots Make sure the bladder is empty a full bladder is one of the causes of uh, Atony very easy to manage so let's start it easy even as we, we, we move high up at, uh, higher up the ladder So catheterize that patient make sure the bladder is empty we had talked about our ABCs. So if the patient is still bleeding at this point, now you want to consider your drugs. So what are some of the options that we, we can we can use? So you have your oxytocin, you can use misoprostol, you can use your symptometrin, or you can use your egometrin, of course, with uh, a lot of cautions. Eh? And then uh, in case you have your cabetocin, again, you can also use that. So let's look at the drugs that we commonly have. So we are commonly going to get oxytocin, and misoprostol. So how do you give oxytocin? So you want to give a repeat bolus of the 10 uh, units and then uh, you follow that with about, about 40 units in half a liter of normal saline. Let this run for about four hours. The other drug you can use, like I said, misoprostol, about 800 micrograms per recto. That will be an adequate dose. Good. Now, make sure that you had checked your placenta and ensured that it is complete. This is where most of us go wrong. You get the placenta from the mother straight to the bucket. You forget to examine it so that if bleeding is to continue, now you start fighting with the lady, your hand is in the uterus, you're trying to explore for anything that was left, any blobs, any membranes still left in situ. Yet, if you had just inspected the placenta you'll have avoided all this so let us please inspect the placentas for completeness good if your patient is still bleeding now you can bring in your manual uh, your bimanual compression your OT compression as even as you start thinking about uh, how this patient sh should now be moving to theater of course you can also use uterine uh, tamponade we'll get a chance to see how uh, this actually work Good, so there is your Rush hydrostatic balloon catheter for uterine tamponade. Now, because of issues of availability and cost, most of us might not be able to access the Rush balloon. So we can use this. You have your male uh, condom and the Foley's catheter. They are connected, like uh, it's been illustrated there. 
inserted in the uterus and filled with the, with water we'll get a chance to see in a different session how this actually uh, actually work good so if you've done all this and your patient is still bleeding of course now you want to consider moving to theater performing a laparotomy uh, in theater what are some of the other things we can do we can compress the water though this is temporary uh, this is done temporarily as you plan to move to the other to the, to the next steps you can use a hemostatic suture like a bilinch a bilinch suture or uh, ligate the uterine arteries and if none of none of this seems to be working you can uh, do a hysterectomy so how do we prevent PPH. Remember the best way to manage PPH is to prevent it. And how do we do this? Number one, we routinely supplement iron in pregnancy. Reason being, we want to avoid anemia, uh, another cause of uh, PPH. And then uh, you also, we always want to be prepared. Always be ready. Make sure your labor ward, your theater is ready to handle massive hemorrhage anytime it occurs. Look out for those women that are at risk and make sure they either deliver in a referral hospital or you are ready to make a referral as uh, soon as need arises. Make sure your supplies are all available, your IV fluids, your cannula, your, your drugs, your balloon tamponade, you have access to blood transfusion uh, services. Again, always being prepared. Good. Use a pathograph so that you prevent prolonged labor, which again might be another risk factor for PPH, active management of third stage of labor. This we routinely do for all women and uh, please let's continue doing it because it's very important in uh, preventing PPH. Good. So after delivery, whether the patient uh, delivers vaginally or it's by a cesarean section, let's monitor the vital signs and uh, look out for any areas of bleeding. The best way to monitor the vitals, let's use our MIOS charts. Eh? Let's use our MIOS uh, chart because, like I said earlier, if you wait for this patient to complicate, then management becomes very, very tricky. And how will you ensure that you are able to intervene before the patient complicates? Pick these issues early enough. Pick that her pulse is rising. Pick that her, uh, she's becoming tachypneic way, way before even the blood pressure falls and act act soon enough good so what have we said let's always recognize obstetric hemorrhage just look at the vitals let 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 them speak to us even before this patient complicates let's remember the causes because when you'll be doing a secondary survey these are the things you'll be looking out for in terms of management always have a protocol remember your ABCs of resuscitation and the blood replacement where available is always uh, very very much recommended and uh, let's remember the methods of arresting hemorrhage that we have uh, talked about thank you